friends, Todd Tomasella here with SafeguardYourSoul.com. Wanted to talk to you a little bit about walking in the spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. The scripture tells us in Romans 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, 1. Now, the new versions, uh, corrupted by the diabolical wolves of the past and some in the present, uh, have chopped that verse in half. In fact, if you have an NASV, a New American Standard Corruption, uh, you'll see that half that verse is cut away, and uh, also NIV and many of the other new versions, which are completely corrupted in many ways. I encourage you to get a King James Bible, a real Bible, the preserved Word of God. But the Scripture says there are two, there are two conditions for walking with God and not being under the condemnation of God, and that's to be in Christ and living after the spirit and not the flesh that's the thesis statement for the first uh 15 or 16 verses of that important chapter of romans 8 in verse 13 uh the apostle paul verse 12 we're not in debt to the flesh to live after the flesh but to christ verse 13 if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body you shall live as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god Romans 8, 13, and 14. It's important to realize that holiness can only come about, true holiness, Ephesians 4, 24, uses that term, uh, and it's to delineate between true holiness and false holiness, which is something we see in the life of the lives of the Pharisees of Christ's day, who clean the outer cup, but inwardly they're, they were full of all kinds of wickedness. Matthew 23, they feigned holiness, but it was absolutely disgusting and not pleasing to God at all. And he told them in that chapter that uh, three times that they would be in hell, every one of them. God is not pleased with a manufactured, uh, contrived holiness that comes by way of the flesh. You'll notice, again, Romans 8, 13, and 14. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. You'll be separated from God, not only in this life, but eternally, and he's talking to the body of Christ, uh, you're going to be under the condemnation of God. Again, verse 1, you must be in Christ, born again, that's initial salvation, and presently living in the Spirit, not in the flesh. There are two conditions in Romans 8, 1, not one. It was Satan himself who comes to take away the Word of God, Mark 8, uh, excuse me, 4, 15, and he's the one that didn't want us to have that, that truth. Thank God for the preserved Word of God in the King James Bible. So if you live after the flesh, verse 13 of Romans 8, you will get, you're going to die. If you live in sin, you're going to be separated from God because Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is still death. God is still holy, holy, holy. That is a great, uh, that is a blindingly, a deafening, missing component in the modern gospel that God is holy, holy, holy. And he commands us to be holy as he is holy. Uh, Isaiah 6, 3, uh, Revelation 4, 8, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Be ye holy, for I am holy. When's the last time you heard a pastor cite that verse? <laughs> Many of these clowns who are vile snakes, Calvinists, uh, are going to talk about the doctrines of grace. The word grace appears, I think it's uh, over 120 times, somewhere around there. If you look it up. The word holy and holiness appears well over 600 times in the Bible, but you're never going to hear them speak the scriptures on holiness. They're going to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness or license for sin uh, by their corrupted grace message. Jude chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, we're to earnestly contend against these ungodly men who are turning the grace of God, our God, into a license for sin. And one of the ways they do that is they conveniently isolate that doctrine they conveniently uh, uh, evade scriptures on grace from the real grace teacher the holy spirit through paul in titus 2 11 and 12 that tells us that grace when you really have it is teaching you to live godly in this present world and to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts isn't that interesting that your so-called modern 
grace teachers following in the footsteps of one of the ultimate worst wolves of all New Testament history, John Calvin, who got his doctrines from uh, metaphysics and from uh, Augustine, a Catholic, etc., and completely uh, corrupted the gospel. And we're to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints uh, the original, in the original gospel uh, against such perversion of the grace of God. The grace of God does not give us a license to sin. In fact, it's a divine enablement to cause us to live free from sin and to have victory over sin. And yet the only way that that's going to be possible, beloved, is through the uh, adhering to the <clears throat> original gospel of Christ, which is to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and to follow him. This is what Jesus said is a must for abiding in a relationship with him, which he said, if you don't abide in me after you've been saved, you're going to be cast into the fire. In other words, in the end, you're going to be uh, thrown into eternal damnation. And it, it's going to be worse with you than if you'd never known the way of righteousness. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. So in enduring to the end to be saved, again, there's initial and final salvation. Most people only realize and have only been taught that there's initial salvation. But there's final salvation. Jesus said, and there's present salvation. Jesus said that you must abide or remain in him to bear the fruit that glorifies God. The fruit doesn't save you, but the relationship that causes that fruit to be born is what saves you. John 15, 1 through 16. Uh, it's important and it's essential for eternal salvation, final salvation, and present salvation that we're rooted in Christ. And the only way to do that is to be honest with the scriptures and adhere to the teachings of Christ given to us in uh, the original gospel, going straight into the gospels and learning of the Lord and walking with him according to his teachings and the teachings of his apostles. And this makes up in summation the 27, and it's given to us in the 27 book canon of the New Testament scriptures. In the end, there'll be no excuse because we've got a Bible. Uh, many listening to me right now have been misled by false teachers. They have this idea that once they've been saved, uh, you know, you hear it in all these Christian songs, you, the so-called Christian songs, and all of these, uh, you know, Christian so-called books that lack scripture and are uh, not preaching the original gospel. Uh, and you've got it throughout Christendom. You've got these wolves who call themselves our pastors who refuse to come out and say that once saved, always saved, is a lie from hell. It's a perversion of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 6, 1 and 2, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The grace of God will not abound, and you can't be saved outside of the grace, the saving grace of God. And that's not just an initial one-time event. That is That begins at a one-time event when you repent, lay down your life, and allow the Lord to save you in full surrender, turning fully to God and Christ, and being washed in His blood, putting all your faith in Him. But that's the beginning. That's not the sum, total, and end of your walk with God. It has to be a relationship. And Jesus says, if you don't abide in me, you don't remain in me, you're going to be cast into the fire. I don't know how it could be any clearer, but you've got these grace perver perverting wolves that have their little acrobatics to deny the word of God. In doing so, they deny Christ in order to keep their tradition that so somehow we're unconditionally, eternally secure. That's a lie from hell. It's the first lie Satan ever told the man and woman in the Garden of Eden when they were in a perfect relationship with God. Sin had not entered, but it led to their fall. God told the man and the woman that if they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would surely die. Satan came back. This is Genesis 2.17 and 3.4. And he said, you shall not surely die. God said they would die if they sinned against him because he's holy, holy, holy. Satan said you would not surely die. That's the first time and the seed of this once saved, always saved. Uh, 
perseverance of the saints is the way Calvinism puts it, uh, evil, diabolical message that we see uh, snakes who pose as pastors hissing from the pulpits every Sunday morning, assuring people that even if they're living in sin because they had some initial relationship with Christ, that they're unconditionally, eternally secure. Uh, we have a book on the website safeguardyoursoul.com and on Amazon in Kindle and print called Lie of the Ages. I highly recommend this book. Uh, your growth in Bible knowledge will explode. This is a 57 chapter blockbuster which sets the record straight for the original gospel and traces this unconditional eternal security lie all the way back before the Garden of Eden, in eternity with Lucifer, and then goes to the Garden, then goes to history, and then present day and all the way into future eternity with Christ. I encourage you to get this book, Lie of the Ages. Now, my friend, as we finish now, I want to encourage you to realize that it's only through the cross of Christ, the original prescription, uh, the original gospel prescription, in denying ourselves, choosing to love God more than ourselves, love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. So in doing so, we let Christ reign in our daily life, his Holy Spirit dwelling and teeming and working big in us to bring about the fruit of the Spirit and the holiness that pleases God and not a manufactured holiness, a feigned holiness uh, that we see being taught out there today with those who uh, regurgitate the evil lies of a false teacher of old named uh, Charles Finney. There are many false teachers propagating and perpetrating these same lies that tell us that we can be holy uh, by our own quote unquote natural ability. This is a lie from hell. The first, first step in victory is realizing first of all and deciding that you want Christ to reign in your life, not self. You want to get dethrone the false God of self uh, and let Christ alone reign in your life. So you re you're willing to lay down your life. You're willing to deny yourself, set yourself aside so that Jesus can reign supreme in your daily life. Uh, the second, I believe, the second step in total victory is realizing there's, like Paul said, Romans 8, uh, 7, 18, there is no good thing that dwelleth in you or me. Paul said there's no good thing that dwelled in him, none, zero, except Christ. That is, there's no good thing in his flesh. Only Christ was the good and the great part of his life. And we must come to that place. We've got a post on safeguardyoursoul.com about the, the fall, fallen nature of man, realizing and understanding that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know them? I uh, helps us and is foundational to us letting Christ reign in our lives. By the way, that was Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. I encourage you to memorize that truth. Uh, God wants us to be full of his spirit so that the life of Christ, who raised the life of Christ, who was raised up by the Holy Ghost of God, uh, will also quicken and make alive our mortal bodies, bringing about the glory of God, the fruit of the spirit, and the holiness that truly pleases God. The only one has to come through the cross. Romans 8, 13 again. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Holy Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. We have to have the power of the divine person of the Holy Ghost uh, working in us, him increasing and us decreasing in order for God to be pleased in our daily life. And that's only going to happen by obeying Jesus and dying to self and praying that God would help you do that by the power of the Spirit. I tell people often, if you want to pray for me, pray that the Holy Ghost will greatly increase in my life so that it will be I will be anointed to the burial of self so that Jesus can reign, not me. Notice what Paul says here as we close in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 12. The apostle writes, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus and the life, so that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, in our mortal body. The only way that the life of Jesus is going to be made manifest and powerfully work 
in our lives and through our lives uh, is that we're bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That's traced directly back. Now remember, this is divinely inspired scripture. This is Jesus' Apostle Paul, and he is uh, reiterating the gospel message Jesus gave where we must die so that Christ may live. Death worketh in us, but life works in us and through us, verse 12 tells us. Right here in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 through 12, I encourage you to make that your meat, to read it every day and to, to meditate upon it and pray God will manifest it in your daily life so that the death of Christ, the co-death that we experience with Christ, Romans 6 uh, and Galatians 2.20, is uh, allowing for the glory of God and the life of Jesus Christ to manifest in our mortal body. God bless you, friend. Thank you for listening. And I uh, hope you'll like this video and also subscribe to the channel. God bless you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.